Hey everybody, I'm still here at the Cliff House Beach Park in Cape Elizabeth and uh, I've changed shirts so that you'll think it's a different day but now I've given away the game so of course yeah no the secret is that I, I make all these videos and a lot of them uh, it's just one right after the other and I change t-shirts in between so that you'll think it's some other day uh, I just get worked up. I really enjoy doing the lectures with you. I enjoy teaching the history. So I finish one and I'm like, I'm ready for another. So yeah, uh, I, wanna, I want you to think it's a different day, so I throw a different t-shirt on. But we're here. It's probably about three minutes after I finished recording the last one. And we are going to talk about chapter 13, section 4 now. 13.4 is about the church. So let's get into it. Originally, the church's view on power was that political power, secular power, non-religious stuff, belongs to kings, and that the church really should have spiritual authority over people. That was the theory, but we know that certain church rulers, like Pope Gregory, ignored that theory and went ahead and pushed for their own secular agendas, despite being spiritual leaders. Now the church is, is run by the leader called the Pope, and the Pope is the boss of all of the church officials. What do we call all of the church officials as one generic term? Clergy. So the Pope is in charge of the clergy, everyone who works for the church, who has the job of saving your soul. Okay? Uh, these officials made sure that people got the religious upbringing that they needed in order to get to heaven, including special ceremonies, called the sacraments. There are seven sacraments, and I'll go through them now because it's kind of interesting to find them out. Uh, according to the Catholic Church, there's seven sacraments. Most Protestant versions of Christianity have fewer than seven, but the Catholic Church believes in seven. There's baptism. Baptism is that important one where the, the sin of Cain killing Abel and the, same, the sin of Eve taking the forbidden fruit is washed off of your soul because we're all descendants of Eve and of Cain. So important, baptism. And then after that, there's communion. Okay, There is sitting down and taking the bread and taking the wine or the grape juice or whatever it happens to be. Uh, interesting little variation here. In the Catholic Church, the belief is that the priest who's at the front of the room was selected by God to be your priest. He was called by God to be your priest, and therefore God has imbued him with special magical spiritual powers. And one of those powers is that when the priest says some holy words over the bread, it literally changes into the flesh of Christ. And when the, the words are spoken with the wine or the grape juice, it literally turns into the blood of Jesus. This is called transubstantiation, changing the substance, transubstantiation. So this idea of transubstantiation is in the Catholic Church. Um, most Protestant denominations don't believe that their minister or their reverend at the front of the room has special magical powers. And so they believe in something called consubstantiation, which is the idea that the reverend, when they say the words over the bread and the wine, Jesus chooses to come in and enter the bread, but it doesn't change into flesh. And that Jesus chooses to come into the wine and enter it, or the grape juice, and it doesn't actually become blood. So there's a difference between Catholic and Protestant right there that's kind of interesting. We won't get to Protestant church until later, uh, because right now there's only one version of Christianity in the Western world, and that's the Catholic Church. So, that's the second sacrament, communion. The third sacrament, uh, um, uh, confirmation. confirmation. When you choose, when you literally choose to declare publicly that you believe in Jesus, that you believe in God, that you believe the only way to get to heaven is through Jesus, and you also choose a confirmation name that will be the name that everyone and God recognizes you from. So confirmation, that's the third. The fourth is confession. Confession. 
Now, this is another interesting one. The theory is that for every sin that you either commit or that you just think about committing, you need to go to confession. This is a Catholic one. Protestants don't believe in confession. Uh, and you'll see because the, the priest has a very important part in, in confession that Protestants don't think priests, uh, that power should be had by human beings or etc. So confession, you commit a sin or you think about committing a sin, you need to go into the church, uh, preferably once a week, and remember every single sin that you've either committed or that you've thought of committing. And you go and you tell the priest. But there's like a protective screen between you so that the priest can't see you. They can hear every word you're saying, but they can't see you. So the priest technically isn't supposed to know who you are. They just hear your sins, and they have God's calling to announce to you how many prayers, memorized prayers, you have to say in order to get God's forgiveness, and that you have to feel bad about committing the sin. That's an important part, too. You have to want God's forgiveness. You have to be repentant. You have to feel guilty and, and want to get God's love and forgiveness back. So, that's confession. You go away and you say those memorized prayers. The most common ones are um, Holy Fathers and Hail Marys. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, you have to, the Lord's Prayer, you have to say these prayers a certain number of times based on how many sins you've committed and how important they were as sins. So if you thought lusty thoughts about somebody else, that's a sin. If you thought about stealing, that's a sin. If you thought about swearing, that's a sin. Not only thinking about it, but actually doing it. So you have to get forgiveness for all those things in confession. The, the next one of the seven sacraments, that was four, I think. Uh, the fifth one is uh, marriage. That your marriage has to be in the church. It has to be in front of God's eyes. It has to be with God's blessing, a holy wedding. The sixth one isn't actually done by most people. It's just done by priests. And that is the holy calling the uh, recognition that God has chosen you to be a priest, and then the training that you go through to become a priest. So that's the sixth sacrament, holy orders. And then the last sacrament is called last rites. This is a final blessing that you get when you're about to die. So if you are deathly sick, and everybody knows this is probably going to be your last week on earth, maybe even your last day on earth. If you're going into battle, and there's a really good chance that you might die, then you might get last rites. It's basically confession, but it's the final confession. And you are forgiven for everything. If you don't get last rites, according to the Catholic Church, then any sins that you had on your soul before that moment that you forgot to ever get forgiveness for from your priest those sins stay with you after death, and you can't go to heaven right away. You have to go to this place called purgatory, and it's kind of like prison, and you have to burn off your sins there for tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, before you can be in heaven. So, um, <clears throat> the seven sacraments. Protestants, some Protestants only believe in five, some believe in four. But the Catholic Church has seven. The Church had baptism, confirmation, communion, confession, holy orders, holy wedding, and last rites. The Church helped the poor. It ran amateur hospitals, and it was responsible for holidays, for festivals, for religious celebrations, feasts for the workers. And you pay your tithe money in order to get those benefits, the 10% of your income every year. The church had a special set of laws called canon law. And canon law was supposed to keep everybody loyal and honest inside the church. If you broke the rules of the church, for example, if you took the name of the Lord in vain, 
if you uh, refuse to follow something that the Pope said was basic understanding in the Catholic Church, then you would be put on trial sometimes if you didn't ask for forgiveness right away. If you didn't recognize it as a sin and want forgiveness, then you'd be put on trial. And if you were found to be guilty in this trial and the Pope made the final decision, you could be excommunicated. Excommunicated means you can't get any of the seven sacraments. And without the seven sacraments, without going to confession, without getting baptized, without uh, having communion, then all the sins that you're committing stay on your soul when you die. Having been cut off from the church, you're literally cut off from God. And in that, you go to hell. So excommunication equals hell, unless you manage to convince the Pope afterward that you're so sorry and you want forgiveness now. That happened on a couple of occasions, but only for super powerful people, right? Not your average Joe. Your average Joe, number one, probably wouldn't do something that would get the Pope's attention. And also, if they did and they were bad enough to be punished that way, they wouldn't get forgiveness. So, unless they asked for it the first time. If you were a king and you got your entire country to disobey the Pope because you said you're more powerful than the Pope because you're blasphemous, you're saying things that go against church beliefs and the Pope's belief, um, then you could actually cause your entire country to be excommunicated. This is called an interdict, I-N-T-E-R-D-I-C-T, -E an interdict. And in an interdict, yeah, you're cut off. Your entire country is cut off. Every church in your country stays closed. No priests are giving communion. No priests are receiving confession. No baptisms, and so every baby that's born there goes to hell, right? This is bad. So an interdict is a punishment that a pope can do on an entire country. And the goal, of course, if you're the pope and you put an interdict down on a country, your ultimate goal is to get the king to apologize and go back on it and beg for forgiveness and obey the pope next time, or to get the general population to rise up in anger and kill the king and put a new king in his place that will obey the Pope. So interdict. It's meant to either force a king to apologize or get him killed by his own people who want the church to be um, offering forgiveness and, and redemption and the path to heaven, according to religion. So the Holy Roman, yes, you guessed it, Empire, the Holy Roman Empire. King Otto I of Germany ruled in the 900s, and he was a strong ruler and a good ruler as Holy Roman Emperor. He helped the church keep control over the people. The Pope rewarded him by making him Holy Roman Emperor, and within a hundred years, the church and the emperors were actually fighting instead of cooperating because the Holy Roman Emperors wanted control of the church inside their territory. They didn't want the Pope to have as much control. The emperors thought that they should get to pick who the bishops were going to be in the church, in the empire. But, of course, the pope doesn't want to allow his church to be run inside the empire by the emperor. And when a non-religious leader picks a bishop and invests them with the job of being bishop, that is called lay investiture. A layman is a person who is not an expert, especially not an expert in the church, not a church official, not called by God to be in the church. And so a lay person like the emperor investing a bishop with the job of being bishop goes against the church teachings. And so the popes threatened to excommunicate the emperors whenever they would pick a bishop for inside the empire. Lay investiture was not okay with the church. In 1075, Pope Gregory just flat out banned it. No, you're not doing lay investiture. That's not going to happen. But Holy Roman Emperor Henry at this time demanded that the Pope step down 
Now, of course, the Pope is supposedly chosen by God. And now the Holy Roman Emperor is telling the Pope that he needs to quit. Who does he think he is, right? So, Gregory excommunicated the Holy Roman Emperor Henry for doing this and put an interdict down on the empire. And so Henry knew he'd screwed up way too bad this time. And so he went to the Pope to beg for forgiveness. When you go to the Pope to beg for forgiveness, you can't go as a king or as an emperor. If you're begging forgiveness, you need to go dressed as a beggar. And so Holy Roman Emperor Henry went to the Pope and begged for forgiveness dressed in a brown cloth robe of a beggar. And the Pope was at his vacation home in the Alps Mountains. And it was snowy there all the time, 24-7. And he didn't want to see Henry. He didn't want this to end right away. He wanted Henry to suffer a little more. He thought Henry hasn't earned forgiveness yet. And so Henry waited in the snow outside the Pope's front door for days, days and nights and days and nights. And eventually, three days and nights went by of Henry waiting, dressed as a beggar, in the snow, outside, before the Pope said, all right, he's had enough. So the Pope opened the door and let him in. Henry begged for forgiveness, and the Pope had to forgive him. It's kind of in the rules. So he said, stay away from trouble, stop it, go home. And uh, just as soon as Henry got home, he started to say that the Pope was wrong, the Pope should quit, and that Henry should be able to pick bishops again. So it didn't solve the problem. It just got Henry out of the interdict so that his own people wouldn't kill him. Eventually, both sides did make a deal. And that deal, or concordat, conquered, just like conquered New Hampshire, not conquered like I conquered a country. That's C-O-N-Q-U-E-R-E-D. This is Concord, C-O-N-C-O-R-D. Uh, the Concordat, or the agreement, Concord means a friendly agreement. So the Concordat of Worms, it's spelled like the word Worms, but in German, W's are pronounced like V's. And so it's the Concordat of Worms. It was named after the German town where they made the deal, uh, in this deal, the Pope would get to pick who the bishops were going to be as long as the Holy Roman Emperor liked that choice. If the Holy Roman Emperor disagreed with who the Pope picked, then the Emperor got to veto it, and the Pope would have to start over picking a new guy. So that's the Concordat of Worms. That's how they solved this issue. The Pope gets to pick, but the Emperor gets veto power. In the year 1152, Emperor Frederick, Holy Roman Emperor over the whole Holy Roman Empire, his nickname was Barbarossa, and Barbarossa is Latin for red beard. So Emperor Frederick was a redhead with a flaming beard. Um, he was chosen as the new emperor in 1152. He tried to get power back from his own nobles. Now the emperor, that's the problem, like... Holy Roman emperors in history never have enough power to really run the empire strongly because the empire is full of different dukes and lords who all think that they are equal to the emperor in power. And so he can never get enough forces together to completely crush all the rebel lords in his own territory. Plus, the popes are constantly messing in the empire with religion. Now, he wanted Frederick Barbarossa wanted more power over his own people. And uh, he invaded some rich Italian cities that were allies with the Pope. And the Pope got involved here. Uh, the Pope put together a group of city-states that would fight back, a northern Italian alliance called the Lombard League. L-O-M-B-A-R-D. The Lombard League. And... They had crossbow soldiers, and these crossbow soldiers were really, really effective. It was kind of a new technology coming out, and the uh, emperor's army just wasn't ready for that. 
So the Pope's Lombard League, with their crossbow soldiers, slaughtered the old-fashioned knights of the Holy Roman Empire. Frederick Barbarossa had to retreat. He lost most of the control over his own nobles again because his army was crushed. Future emperors would again try to take power away from the nobles and power away from the popes, but they were never really very successful at unifying the empire or keeping control over the popes and the nobles or the states and the princes in the empire. So, there you have it. Chapter 13 is over, but that's only the early Middle Ages. There's another whole chapter on the Middle Ages, chapter 14, and we'll be getting to that super soon. So, the early Middle Ages are over. Do you feel any better? The, the later Middle Ages are actually going to be a time of a lot of scientific and learning advances, and uh, it, it's going to be a happier time. Chapter 14 is going to have some happier stuff, although from time to time, things like the Crusades happen that really defy the definition of happiness for sure. So, next time.